Hey guys, uh, my name is Andrew. Um, I just wanted to share my full testimony on how I came to Christ and the uh, the up and down roller coaster that my life has been for the last few months. Um, to give you a little bit of background about myself, um, I was a wrathful person, a person of extremely ill temperament. You know, the type of person that um, somebody looks at you the wrong way, just watch out. You know, just really wrathful person. Uh, heavily addicted to alcohol, cigarettes, marijuana. I was spending uh, $800 a month on weed. I'd be getting drunk every night, smoking a pack and a half of cigarettes every day. Um, <clears throat> and uh, a life of homosexuality and sexual perversion uh, from a very young age. Uh, and that's just that's, that was just the way my life was. I was never never happy about the way my life was, but that's that, that is the way that it was. Um, this testimony is unique in that it involves the deliverance of, of two people to Christ, not just one. Uh, this story is about my best friend Dylan. <coughs> my best friend Dylan, uh, who was born and raised in Trinidad, has only been in Canada for two years. Um, and we started to hang out with each other in August of last year, 2017. And the things that he would tell me about his life just broke my heart, you know. Um, his, his punching, his, his grandfather, he was half Japanese and half Persian uh, and born and raised in Trinidad. Uh, so his grandfather being <clears throat> a descendant of uh, the Asakura clan of Japanese warriors, trained him as, as, as a warrior, as a child from the time he was uh, three, four years old, he trained him as a warrior. Uh, and I never, I never understood why. Uh, his punching bag as a child was a two inch rope wrapped around a tree. Um, his grandfather used to make him squat over like a watering bucket uh, for hours at a time. Uh, the, his grandfather would blindfold him and his little brother, his little brother as well. Uh, everything I'm talking about him, his little brother had to go through as well. Um, would, would blindfold him and send him out and through the forest through, through an obstacle course, through booby traps with bees and wasps and fire and pitfalls and, and things like that. So he would have to learn how to listen for the danger in absence of his sight. Uh, so everything that everything that I found out about him broke my heart. Um, <clears throat> so um, over time, we began to live together, and uh, he he wasn't sleeping not whatsoever. I was his supervisor, his boss at work, and he'd, we'd be living together, and he, he wouldn't be sleeping. He wouldn't be sleeping at all. Um, you know, a week you'd get maybe two hours of sleep, three hours of sleep a week, and I, I always wanted. I, so I asked him. I said, "Hey, what's going on? Like you're not sleeping at all, and you have to come to work and you and you perform. So, so what's going on?" And he said, um, "You know, first he brushed it off as as insomnia. He's like, oh, don't worry, insomnia, insomnia. But you know, a week would go by, two weeks would go by, and I, so so I asked him again. I said, "Hey, what's going on? Why why aren't you sleeping?" And he said, "The voices in my head will not let me sleep." So, so you know, me being born and raised here, you know, mental health and, and all that kind of stuff, I say, okay, so you're schizophrenic. We understand what this is here, no problem at all. I said, you are schizophrenic. And I said, there is a way to help this. We can get through this. I said, anytime you're ready to reach out, when you are ready, we will get you the best doctors that money can buy. I will get you the best help. Just reach out when, when, when you feel comfortable. <clears throat> so, you know, again, you continue and over time, uh, you know, I wake up in the middle of the night and he's watching things like Jack the Ripper, you know, of all these kinds of serial killers and all this kind of stuff. And I asked, I said, what does this do for you? And he said, it gives me a thrill. And later over time, he, he confides in me that he very much, he wants to hurt people, that nothing would please him more than to murder, kill, and dismember people. And it's contrary to anything I've ever understood. Um, People want the best for the people around them. Nobody wants any harm to come to the people around them. Even if you don't like that person, even if you don't like that person uh, in your life, you don't you don't want any physical bodily harm to come to them. That is what you know being a human being is about: is love and care and nurturance uh, for the people around you. Um, so again, I say to him, I said, whenever you're ready to get help, kid, whenever you're ready to get help, Dylan, reach out to me, and we will get you the best help that we can get you. Um, so there was an argument that took place one night. Though me and Dylan were living together, <coughs> though me and Dylan were living together, we were not the only people in the house. I had my, my ex-partner, Paul, uh, 
living living with me still. We were trying to get him on his feet and on his way, uh, so he could you know be financially independent and he can he can do right by him himself. Um, and there was an argument that took place one night. Paul came out and he was very upset, and uh, Dylan fogs over the way that he does uh, that I've seen so many times before. Um, and that night I knew that there would be blood if I did not remove him from my property. So I said, Dylan, get on your jacket. I said, I am gonna take you. We're gonna go on a little, a little adventure. We're gonna get you out of the house. I said, put on your jacket and I'll be right back. So I went to my bedroom uh, to settle down Paul. And Paul slams the door. He wouldn't, he wouldn't let me out of the room and we're arguing. And I, I, I went as far as to, to threaten Paul with physical bodily harm. I said, if you do not get your hand off this door, I will hurt you myself because because anything that I could do to Paul would not be in anything in comparison to what Dylan would do. Not one person would have died that night. It would have been many, many people. Uh, so I get out of the room and I go to where I left Dylan and I didn't find Dylan. I didn't find Dylan. He was standing there. His hands were at his side. His head was tilted back in his head. His eyes were rolling back in his head. And I'm shaking him and I said, Dylan, and I'm shaking him and I'm shaking him. But his feet were glued to the ground. He's 110 pounds and he had no muscle retention in his body whatsoever. He was completely limp, but I couldn't move his feet from the ground, not one centimeter. I couldn't move him, just his upper body was moving around. And I felt something in my right hand and a voice in my head said, slap him. But I didn't want to slap him. Uh, you know, being on a verge of a schizophrenic breakdown, uh, that's what I thought it was, being on the verge of a schizophrenic breakdown where he's gonna go on like a killing spree, uh, I didn't want to slap him. I didn't know if I would push him over the edge. Uh, so again, I'm shaking him and I'm shaking him and his head tilts down and his face turns serpentine in nature just like a snake. And he said in a voice that's not his own, he said, who is more powerful, me or him? And I'm shaking him and I'm shaking him, but I cannot move him. And I, 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 the voice was taunting me, like, who's going to win this thing? Uh, and again, I felt that, that power in my right hand. It said, slap him. And I slapped him. And he came back right away. He came back right away. Uh, and he had no recollection of any of this. He was completely, he had no memory of it. All he had was a splitting headache. Um, all he had was a splitting headache and he just needed to go to sleep. So we put him to bed and for the first time in his life, for the first time in his life, the next 24 hours after that occurred, he didn't have a voice in his head. So it was my first, <clears throat> my first understanding that, that there was a way to fight this. Um, so, you know, that experience changed my perception on what it was from a medical standpoint to the one of the realm of, of spirituality. Uh, so, you know, him having a hard time sleeping, we start dosing him up with sleeping pills. I start giving him melatonin so that he can sleep. Um, and every night I would wait for him to go to sleep before I would go to sleep on my living room floor. Because uh, he, has, he has a very hard time when he uh, sleeps, he tosses and he turns and I don't want him to, you know, lose control in the middle of the night and, and, and go out on, on, a, on a rampage. Um, so I would sleep on the living room floor so I can keep an eye on him after he went to sleep. Every night, every night I would lock the door and I'd be afraid. I didn't know if I would need, I didn't know if I would need that extra couple seconds to unlock the door <clears throat> to get out, to use it as an escape route. I didn't know if I would need that extra couple seconds to get out, but every night I would lock the door for the well being of other people, anybody who would be unintelligent enough to enter into my home uh, for, their well, for their well being, not for mine. So, <clears throat> so now I start to get this idea that, that maybe he is possessed, like the, like the doctors back home always sent him to a priest, they told him he was possessed. Started to think, okay, maybe he is possessed. So I started looking up, uh, you know, things of demonology. Um, and I came across the 72 demons of Solomon. And right away, I, I go, going through that list, I found Andrus. Um, and it says, He's the most feared and the most gruesome of all the 72 demons of Solomon. He's the slayer of man, gives 
the people who he takes a liking to um, unwavering fear or unwavering strength like there's no fear whatsoever and the greatest fear and the greatest calamity you stand unshaken uh, so I woke up after after finding you know these things about Andrus this demon and I start to tell him about it and he looks shook he looks shaken um, so there's an illustration kind of like a drawing on, on the based on the description of what's in the book of 72 demons of Solomon and I show him the picture and uh, he looked very scared and later he confides in me that, that he sees him when he sleeps and you know even when he's having a rough time and he looks in the mirror you know he'd be having a rough time and we'd be in the car and I said look at your face I said your face is disgusting right now I said look at your face and I'd slam down the vanity mirror so he could in the car so he could see himself and he'd instantly he'd turn his head away and he said he didn't want to look and he confided in me it's because when he looks in the mirror when he's having a rough time he doesn't see himself he sees Andrus so I was ready to take up arms. I was ready to become anything. Like I needed answers, and I love this kid so much. I, I I was ready to become a Wiccan high priest if it if it if it came to that. I started doing research on demonology and uh, going to occult stores. The first time I went to an occult store after this, I I spent I think close to four hundred dollars on you know crystals and sage and incense and herbs for 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 exorcism cauldrons and, and, and uh, charcoal to burn these herbs, uh, black tourmaline and selenite, like all these different uh, crystals. Because um, I, I needed to fight. I was, I was ready to fight for him. And I started to do you know rich, uh, research into witchcraft on how I could summon this demon so I could get answers. I, would, I was ready to ask him face to face, what is going on? Um, <clears throat> so I went to sleep one night on my living room floor after Dylan had went to sleep after the sleeping pills kicked in and I said I said if I can take this affliction for one night to give this boy peace I said so be it and that was the biggest mistake I've ever made in my life you know I'd asked him before on what it's like to have all these voices in his head and he said the one voice the, is the main voice he's, he says he's like he's like the ringleader he has a great influence um, and he said the other voices are kind of like cheerleaders kind of like reinforcing what the main voice is saying so I went to bed that night after saying if I could take this affliction for one night so be it to give this boy peace and I went to bed and a darkness came over me a darkness like I've never experienced before and I curled up really small in the fetal position and there was a voice in my head and it said you want to know what it's like say yes and I knew what he wanted he wanted control of my body and I said no I said no no he kept saying do you want to know what it's like you want to know what it's like say yes and I got smaller and this, the darkness got got deeper and deeper and the influence that's what I, the influence that my friend Dylan was talking about I experienced firsthand and I said yes and instantly I was thrown to the back of my mind and I could only see what was happening to me and he took my body and I'm writhing and I'm contorting and I'm growling like an animal and I'm twisting and I'm turning and I can't even speak about what he did but know that in one fell swoop he defiled my mind my body and my soul and I can never I can never take back the memories of what happened <laughs> never take back the memories of what happened I'll remember it for the rest of my life so the next day I went to work Dylan could not go to work he was having a rough time and when I came home you know we're sitting and we're eating dinner and he's he's having a really rough time he's fogged over the way he does and I could tell that he was fighting he was fighting and due to the darkness that happened the night before me being possessed I couldn't I couldn't even finish my last meal I had no appetite but I, I was sitting there and I was broken I was broken and I just said to myself what do I do and right away an answer came into my head fast for 40 days and 40 nights so the first thing I did was to pull out my phone and to look at the calendar. Was to pull out my phone and look at the calendar and I start counting out the days. This was April 5th that, that I got this answer. And uh, I started counting out the days and it was April 6th. 
to May 16th. It was an astronomical amount of time, and it's not something I wanted to do. It's not something I wanted to do at all. Nobody wants to go six weeks without food. But even while looking at the calendar, I said, I will start tomorrow. I will start tomorrow. And I didn't even finish my last meal uh, before going on this fast. Because I had no appetite. And uh, I didn't tell Dylan what I was going to do for two reasons. One, I didn't want to sound crazy. Uh, and two, I didn't know if I was going to be able to be successful. I didn't know if I was going to be able to go 40 days and 40 nights without food. So, um, so I didn't tell him. And, uh... I woke up, went to work the next day on April 6th, and Dylan couldn't go to work. He was having a, he was having a tough time. Like I said the night before, he was, he was fighting. So I went to work and I came home on the first day of my fast, and, um, and I came inside and his hands were on his head and he said, something is not right. Something is not right. And I said, what's going on? And he says, he's screaming. He's screaming in my head. So I knew what I was doing was having an effect on him. I knew that, you know, day one of my fast, and Dylan didn't know what I was doing. It's actually the third day of my fast before he even asked me, he's like, are you sick? He's like, you haven't been eating, are you sick? And I said, no. And, uh, you know, I, as soon as I started going on this fast, I started looking up about, about fasting, especially for 40 days and 40 nights. And uh, one thing the scripture says is while fasting, um, don't put on a somber face as to be seen by men, anoint your head with oil and wash your face. And what you do in secret, God will reward openly. So I didn't tell anybody, nobody knew that I was fasting. Not my parents, not my employers, not, not anybody I worked with. Nobody knew I was going on this fast. It wasn't until the third day that I was fasting that Dylan uh, kind of put two and two together and he said, are you sick? And I said, no. He said, are you fasting? And I didn't answer his question. So he got, he, he, knew, he knew that I was due to my silence. Um, so uh, day one of my fast I come home he says you know he's screaming in my head so I knew what I was doing was having an effect on him and uh, I went to bed that night and as I was drifting off to sleep John 316 uh, came in not John 316 316 just the number like 316 came into my head and I wasn't I didn't I didn't have a religious bone in my body even at this point I don't know why you know when I asked I got an answer um, but I didn't have a religious bone in my body. So 316 came into my head. So immediately I go to Google <clears throat> and I write 316 and John 316 pops up. So I click it and it said, and it didn't say what you all, you're all thinking John 316 is. It said, greater love hath no man than this, than a man is to lay down his life for his friends. So I went to bed night, that night thinking that it was John 316. And it was so powerful for uh, so powerful to me that it was another confirmation that what I was doing was right. So the next morning I woke up, and again I wanted to see it. I wanted to see those words that I'd seen the night before, uh, because it was so powerful to me. So I typed John three sixteen, and bam, John three sixteen pops up that God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. So I'm like, wait a minute. I said, that's not what popped up last night. So I typed the words that I saw last night. Greater love hath no man than this, than a man is to lay down his life for his friends. And John 15, 13 pops up. So again, it was confirmation that, you know, he was speaking to me. That he was speaking to me and that what I was doing was right. So I go on this fast. And each night of the fast, Dylan got worse and worse. You know, the... By the end of his fast, I was giving him 30 milligrams of melatonin, which is three times the maximum dose, uh, into, in addition to a 500 milligram antihistamine, a sleep easy pill. Uh, I was giving him enough tranquilizer to take out a small horse, uh, in my opinion. I'm not a medical expert, but enough tranquilizer to take down a small beast, and uh, he's 110 pounds and he wouldn't sleep. So I go on this fast, and um, you know, about two weeks into the fast, my body was like ready to give up. I I went to the bathroom and I was just dry heaving, just like wanted to spill my guts, but there was nothing that was that, that could come out, obviously, because I hadn't eaten. And I'm just dry heaving and dry heaving, and I just call out to Jesus. I just called out to him for the first time ever. I said, I cannot do this alone, Jesus, please help me. And right away, all the nausea was gone, right away. So, you know, I take up arms, I grab my Bible, I, I purchased a Bible, and I just started reading the scripture almost every day, every day, every day. 
Mm -hmm. almost every day, four or five hours, four or five hours a day. I would, you know, I'd come home, I'd cook for Dylan, I'd cook for Dylan every day on my fast, uh, feed him, and I'd, you know, be in my room from 6.30 at night until 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, just reading. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, one thing I would do when I was fasting is I would um, spend a lot of time in the shower. I'd just, like, sit there, you know, with the water and just, like, be with my thoughts. Uh, and you know it was about halfway through my fast and I I was crying out to him and I just said hey God I want to do this right like I hope I'm doing this right and uh, I'd already finished by this point I'd already finished the New Testament and I had started in, in the Old Testament and I was uh, towards the end of Genesis and I said God I want to do this right I hope I'm doing it right if there's anything that you can do to let me know uh, that I'm doing this right and it said skip over Exodus start Leviticus right away um, So I went and I opened the book of Leviticus and it's very much a rule book on how to conduct yourself uh, Within the Holy Tabernacle of the Lord now a lot of these rules are are abolished through the sacrifice that that Jesus Christ did for us But one of the things that were there that really spoke to me was about homosexuality um Oh, on the second day of my fast, on the second day of my fast, sorry, rewind, on the second day of my fast, I went to, to work, and on the first day of my fast, I was, I was still smoking. I smoked uh, some cigarettes, I smoked some weed, uh, but it was very much like a 95% reduction. I, did, I didn't feel like I should be smoking if, I, if, I'm, if I'm fasting for the Lord. So, um, so I came home the second night, and I said, I want to do this right. And again, bam, the same same answer. I don't want to say the same voice because it's not a voice. It's not like an auditory hallucination or anything. But the same voice said, uh, kind of came back to me in a question, a question for me to ponder on. It said, are you to be successful in what you are doing if you were to put toxins in your body and not nutrients? And I was like, oh, of course not. Of course not. How can I fast for 40 days and 40 nights if I'm just putting toxins in my body and no food, right? Uh, and then right away, again, Nothing shall pass your lips for 40 days and 40 nights except for water in the Word of God And I wasn't a religious person. I didn't own a Bible or anything So so that was day two of my fast, you know fast forward and I'm sitting in the shower and crying out to him I need help if I'm doing this right and it goes to Leviticus it Tells me to go to Leviticus and I go there and I didn't know the Bible and it was bam I open it and it's a rule book on how to conduct yourself within the holy tabernacle of the Lord in front of him uh, and the part about homosexuality uh, spoke spoke out to me a lot. So, um, it was all just kind of confirmation after confirmation that what I was doing was right, and it kept giving me the strength to move on. Um, I I went out on the the second last the second last Saturday of my fast uh, to a place that I love very uh, very much. If anybody lives in Ontario, uh, Mono Cliffs, just uh, just north of Caledon there. It's my favorite place to hike. Um, and I always start the, the hike in the same way. You start off at the top of a cliff and you, you walk down the stairs and you go through the forest to this beautiful pond and you kind of sit there for a little while. But then you have to go up a hill, you have to go up a big hill to kind of climb, climb the cliff again because you came down the stairs. So I went down the stairs and I'm walking through the forest and I thought I got lost. I thought I got lost because the ground was completely transformed. It didn't even look like the same place. Uh, just like the transformation that was taking place inside of me, uh, the ground was completely transformed. That pond that, I, that I'm talking about had broken way into not a stream, not a brook, a river, and it's like six feet wide and the water was rushing and flowing. Uh, so there was very much transformation that was taking place in the physical as well as inside of me. So I went to this pond and it had never been more beautiful in my entire life, never been more beautiful. And I sat there, I sat there and I was glorifying him, I was having a really good time. Uh, and something swam across the water and approached my feet, a serpent, a snake, and it stood right in front of me. And again, that same kind of voice, if you will, in my head. What do you do when the serpent approaches? And I turned my back and I walked away. So I approached that hill uh, and I was really nervous. Uh, when I'm fully fed, when I'm fully fully fed and have all the nutrients in my body, um, I don't like that hill, that hill's huge. Um, and I get out of breath every single time, so I stood there and 
I walked up that hill and I didn't lose breath. I very much felt like there was a hand on my back just pushing me up and I just glided up that hill. So I completed my hike and I, I got into my car to drive home <clears throat> and you drive down second line or second side road, whatever one it is. And I approached the first stop sign. Now when you're driving, there's a lot of animals that you kind of slam on your brakes to avoid. Um, squirrels, raccoon, deer certainly. Um, but birds, you kind of just like be cautious and they fly out of your way, right? So I had to slam on my brakes 10 to 15 feet in front of the stop sign because there was two birds there and I'm kind of slowing down and being cautious about it. But they didn't fly away and I had to slam on my brakes. And uh, slammed on my brakes and I looked at them and there was two doves sitting there, two doves. And once I acknowledged that it was two doves, they flew away. Again, it was another powerful experience that I had, you know, surfing at the water, two doves at the stop sign, that what I was doing was right. Um, so I went to work the next day, and uh, it was a rough day. I was under spiritual attack. Like, it was just, it was a really bad day, a really bad day. Right after the serpent approached me, and it's like, you know, to me it spoke as to, you know, the temptation involved. And I had my good friend Brian there, who's a, who's a religious guy. And he said, hey, what's going on? And I said, I am under attack. And I, again, nobody knew that I was fasting, so nobody could... Uh, could understand or anything he said what's going on and I said I am under attack and he says I can see that and uh, he pulled he pulled out a prayer I think it was Psalms 3 I think it was Psalms 3 and it uh, kind of about being the armor the shield God being your shield and um, and it helped it was it was it was good it was I'm glad for the for the brothers and sisters that God has placed in my life to help me get through this so um, I guess we might as well fast forward to the 41st day, the 41st day of my fast. Um, I woke up on the on the 41st day, which is very much the end of the 40th night. It's the end of the 40th night. It was like six in the morning, and Dylan was having the worst night of his life, the worst night of his life, and he couldn't come to work again. So I packed a lunch because I was finally able to eat. The flat fast had completed, but I didn't know that if because I had smoked on the first day of my fast, if I had to give an extra one to the Lord. So I didn't eat my lunch that day. Didn't eat my lunch because I didn't know if I would compromise my fast. So I came home on the 41st day. <laughs> All glory to God. And I opened the door. And Dylan was sitting there watching TV and I said, Dylan, how are you? And for the first time in his life, he said, I am good. He no longer has that voice in his head. He no longer goes on nightly adventures where he acquires weapons, none of which he has any recollection of getting. No more murderous rage. He doesn't go to that place when he sleeps anymore. Um, every night since he was three years old, he went to the same place when he slept and he just describes it as hellish. He says, the, fall, the ground falls away beneath my feet. Um, he feels like he, he's trapped. He's trapped sometimes. He's trapped. And he says he always goes to a different place, but he knows it's the same place. He says it's, it's an expansive place. Um, but he doesn't go there anymore. He's completely delivered from this, and he's, he's found his way to Christ. Um, oh, to kind of go back to his grandfather, uh, you know, I came to the realization that all the abuse that that his grandfather subjected him to as a child was was for his own benefit it wasn't it wasn't abusive by any means um, his mother passed away um, when he was three years old and his grandfather was 94 years old when he got these two beautiful babies that he'd have to care for and he knew he wouldn't be in this world very much longer so he had to do whatever he could uh, for these boys to teach them how to survive especially being in a third world country where it wasn't very safe um, so he taught them how to, he, he taught, he trained them as warriors. He trained Dylan as a warrior because he saw the darkness inside of him from age three. And he knew that, um, he would need the strength of a warrior to overcome the darkness that was inside of him. The tattoo that he wrote on his arm, love, um, he prophesied on his arm. He prophesied on his arm in ink because he knew love would be what he needed to overcome uh, this affliction for his deliverance. So uh, I came to understand that none of it was abuse. Um, upon completing my fast, I am no longer a homosexual. I have no desire to be with any man. Um, addiction went away. 
gluttony, wrath, all of it. All of it. He, two souls were delivered in this process, and that's the the power, the mercy, and the grace of our Lord and Savior. Um, so when I came home on the forty first day, uh, you know, around dinner time, and he was finally okay. Um, I fasted for the rest of that night as well uh, as a thank you, as a thank you to the Lord for everything that he's done in both of our lives. Um, so it was 41 days and 41 nights. Um, it's kind of just a shadow of the story I could sit and I, I have told the story to friends and it takes like three, four hours just like from beginning to end. I'm not going to bore you with all the gruesome and redundant details. Um, but I, I thank him every single day uh, for the miracles that he's that of deliverance that he's worked in in two people's lives so I just wanted to thank you for taking the time to watch this video and uh, I hope it resparks rekindles and renews uh, brings you closer to the Lord if, if, if that's possible I know you're all very devout um, but that's my testimony and how he's worked in my life now everything that's happened since then then at the 30 days to follow are just a testimony in of itself uh, I guess maybe I'll make another video on that but uh, that's, that's the deliverance of two souls through 40 days and 40 nights of fasting.